All right, so we're on Route 66, and uh, we are on the second leg of the journey. So we're, we're here in Missouri, and again, we're making 12 stops uh, through Missouri, correlating with the 12 books uh, of Old Testament history. Last week, of course, our, our second stop, and we, uh, we landed up in uh, Times Beach there. And uh, today we're just going to go a little further down the road on Route 66 and eventually come to, uh, to Sullivan, Missouri. But uh, right before you get to Sullivan, there is a, a spot that uh, almost everybody that goes down Route 66 sort of for the nostalgia trip and uh, are just, you know, having a good time, tend to stop at uh, Merrimack Caverns. And uh, this is, a, uh, of course, uh, one of the uh, kind of natural wonders uh, of our country. I don't know, have any of you ever been to Merrimack Caverns? Yeah, oh, just a few of you. Um, Anyway, uh, I remember going there and, and in our little funny deal that Biff and I did, uh, I, I think I told you that, uh, you know, some people go in there and they're just in awe how cool this is. And I was a little kid and it just scared the snot out of me. I don't know why, I don't know why but I do remember at one point in time they took you into this huge room and, and, uh, and they turned the lights out just to show you how absolutely dark it was in there. And I think I had a panic attack. So. Uh, the first of many, by the way, uh, right there. I think that's where it started. But anyway, Merrimack Caverns. And, uh, but one of the things that very few people know about Merrimack Caverns is that the owner of Merrimack Caverns is credited with inventing the bumper sticker. And uh, this is true story. And uh, people would go in to see the caverns. And while they were in there, he would send his kids out and plaster all the cars in the parking lot with these Merrimack Caverns bumper stickers. And supposedly, that's the origin of the bumper sticker. Um, also, uh, again, this was supposed to be the place where Jesse James hung out, and after you see Merrimack Caverns, you can go uh, next door to the Jesse James Wax Museum and uh, be brought up to speed on that. When you hit Sullivan, it's kind of goofy, but honestly, the big deal about Sullivan, Missouri, is that uh, they have this, this uh, strange thing they decided to do, which was, let's uh, decorate all of our fire hydrants. And all the dogs were a little upset with it. No, just kidding. Uh, and uh, there's like 59 fire hydrants that have been decorated, but 27 of them have Route 66 themes. And so uh, we've actually been through three of these. You, you might not uh, remember them, but they're Chicago, and the, there's uh, the, the Ted Drew's ice cream stand is one of them, and one of them is the place that where the, you know, the uh, uh, little hot dog thing, uh, corn dog was invented. But anyway, so th this is the big, you know, the big appeal <laughs> to Sullivan, Missouri. Anyway, um, uh, for, I, I, I think that the, uh, the corresponding book that we're going to look at then this morning, as uh, we, you know, Dave talked a little bit about, is the booth, the book of Ruth, and this makes up our third stop here in the uh, uh, twelve stops along the way there in the history of Israel, and and it's a it's a really a neat little book. It's a story of how God works in the lives of faithful people even in the midst of an unfaithful land. So remember, this is taking place during the time of the judges. We looked at last week. Uh, everybody, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a chaotic time in the history of Israel. The last statement that's made in the book of Judges is that everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. But there are people that are faithful during this time, and it's a great little story about what happens to someone that stays faithful, even in an unfaithful land, and how God uses it in amazing ways. Um, by the way, this little book is read every year in the Jewish community. This is the book that they read at the time of Tabernacles, which was just you know, a week or so ago. So we're, we're, we're right in sync kind of with the time of the year uh, because it's a story that takes place to, at harvest time. And of course, that's what Tabernacles uh, celebrate. It's a story, it's, it's, it's really a love story. It's a love story ultimately about God's faithful love for us. And one of the things I noticed reading through it is it really follows a very uh, normal story structure, uh, three acts, and we'll look at it today by breaking down each of these three acts. And the first act you might think of, or we might simply call, Naomi's bitterness. And uh, I'll begin by reading a couple of uh, verses here out of Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. 
The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to Moab and lived there. So the context of the story is that there's famine uh, in Israel. And by the way, remember, when we looked at some of the judges, this, this was a problem because foreign invaders would come in. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that they would do is they would just pillage uh, you know, the, the nation and they would, uh, they would steal the crops. And, and it was a very, very hard time uh, during these periods of time when foreign invaders ruled over Israel. And so here we're simply told that uh, this is a, a family, and they're from Bethlehem. Uh, by the way, it, when you're reading the text, if you've always wondered, what is an Ephrathite? Because that's one of the phrases that's used to describe them. And supposedly, uh, those were families that could trace their lineage back really to uh, the beginning of the founding of the city of Bethlehem. And so this is, you know, there's a, there's a line here uh, in terms of who these people were. But there's famine in the land, and uh, this particular family uh, deals with that by uh, crossing over to the other side uh, of the Dead Sea into the region of Moab uh, in order to uh, simply to survive. You know, one of the things that really strikes me, and um, the book is so small and so easy to read, I mean, you can read through it in just a few minutes, but sometimes I think when we do that, we, we don't stop to think about how hard life was for these people. I mean, most of us in this room have never been in a situation where we didn't know where the next meal was going to come from. I mean, we as a nation are so blessed that famine hasn't really been a part of our history. But, but life was hard for these folks. And uh, not only was it hard in terms of their initial situation here, but it's about to get a lot harder. And so they travel to Moab. And when they get to Moab, we read this. Now, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. And they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. And after they had lived there about 10 years, both Malan and Kilian also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. This is a hard deal, again, um, Hard for us to, to probably even get a handle on how difficult this was for Naomi. Um, Allison and I last night, by the way, were, uh, were at a fundraiser uh, for Fanconi's anemia, uh, which is a, a relatively rare disease, but it's almost always fatal. And uh, children that are born with it, uh, I think the average life expectancy is around 12 or 13. And some very dear friends of ours, uh, about 10 years ago, had uh, two uh, children that both died from Fanconi's anemia, and about a year apart. And, and I can remember just thinking, how in the world did, can you, could you handle that? I mean, it would just seem to me so absolutely devastating. And then on April 6th, a couple of months ago, and you'll remember this, uh, the husband, uh, tried to stop the next door neighbor from murdering his wife, and the guy turned the gun on him and murdered him. And here's our dear friend uh, who has lost two kids and has, has now lost her husband. And, you know, my you know, sense was, my gosh, how can anybody, you know, get through something like this? And this is what happens to Naomi. And so there's tragedy here of a magnitude that is hard to understand. Uh, her husband has died. The sons marry Moabite women, Moabite women, who, by the way, they weren't supposed to. This was against, you know, the instructions that, that uh, God had given through Moses. Sons die, you know, incredible grief. Ten extremely 
different, difficult and tough years. And, and initially, when you see Naomi's perspective on this, you, you have to empathize with her because I feel like this would probably be a bit of how I would, you know, at least initially, uh, respond to this. And so in the text, um, she makes this statement that it's more bitter for me than for you. And this is actually when she gets back to Bethlehem. But the Lord, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. And so here's someone that's, you know, again, I, I think a faithful, you know, follower of the living God uh, there in Israel. And it just feels, it has to feel like, you know, God has abandoned me. Uh, the Lord's hand has gone out against me. One of the great struggles, I think, intellectually that many people have, even kind of outside of the faith, uh, and, and really one of the reasons I think that some people legitimately have a hard time coming to faith is what has been called the, uh, the ultimate philosophical question. And that is, if God exists and he's all-powerful, and he is all good, why do so many bad things happen in the world? Uh, sometimes it's been phrased as, why do bad things happen to good people? I think also we could phrase it in terms of our context, why, why do bad things happen to God's people? Because they really do. I mean, we, we live in a world where oftentimes um, Tragedy strikes us in ways that, from our perspective, makes us feel like Naomi, that the Lord's hand has gone out against us. And why does that happen? And really, you know, uh, trying to kind of get our arms around it, I think there's a number of reasons why, why bad things happen. Uh, sometimes bad things happen because it is judgment from God. So we've just looked uh, at a book called Judges, where when the people rebelled against God, they experienced, well, first of all, the people that lived in the land and uh, had reached a point of being unsalvageable, God judges them. And so, again, much of the Old Testament is the story of God using the nation of Israel and giving them the land, not because of how good they are, by the way. I mean, the Bible is pretty clear. He gives them the land as judgment against the wickedness of the nations that are there in the land. And so sometimes, you know, bad things happen because of judgment. Sometimes it's discipline. And I would say maybe Ruth, I mean, not Ruth, uh, judges might be a better uh, example of discipline where, again, uh, the nation gets off track and they rebel against God and God uses these outside uh, foreign nations to come in and to create situations of great difficulty and he does it as discipline to kind of get their attention and, and out of that difficult time for them to repent and to turn back to God. And again, Judges just shows us these, you know, cycle after cycle of that happening. So sometimes it's discipline. Uh, sometimes bad things happen because we make bad decisions. And, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult if you're talking with someone that has really done some stupid things and then kind of say to you, boy, why did God let that happen? And you just bite your tongue, don't you? You know, because... Honestly, the reason that bad things have happened is because they've done, you know, stupid things. And so sometimes, you know, um, we are our own worst enemies and bad judgment, bad decision make bad things happen. Sometimes it is a result of spiritual warfare. And, uh, you know, Satan is called the destroyer in Scripture, Book of Revelation uh, Two different names are used. One is the, the Hebrew word for destruction, and the other is the Greek word for destroyer. And, and, and uh, you know, Jesus, you know, made reference to this in John chapter 10, where he said he calls him the thief, and he says the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. And so we're engaged in a war, and sometimes bad things happen in that war, and it's not that, uh, you know, so much that the evil one is winning, but the reality is that some difficulty in life is really the outcome of spiritual warfare. And we need to be aware of that. And sometimes we blame God. And, 
And I guess from the standpoint of God's sovereignty, you can say, well, he certainly has allowed it to happen, but the person we should be really mad at is the devil because he is a destroyer. And then a lot of times bad things happen because frankly, we live in this fallen world and it's difficult to remember in the midst of difficulty that things, virtually nothing is the way it really ought to be. And someday God is going to intervene, He's going to change that, and that's one of the huge messages of Scripture. But in the meantime, when you're in the middle of this, it's not unusual to feel like Naomi did, that the Lord's hand has gone out against me. And I believe that when that happens to us, it can be very confusing. And it's not, you know, and, and we probably find ourselves asking the question, where is God in this? And I find myself asking that periodically when I see things that have happened or experience things that just don't make any sense to me. How in the world can this be part of God's plans? I remember, you know, C.S. Lewis, and if you know much about Lewis, uh, he married at a very late age, and he actually married Joy, his wife, primarily uh, so that she could stay in the United States. Initially, it didn't seem like there was a, they had known each other for a long time, they corresponded for a long time, and who knows what was going on emotionally, but it didn't really seem to be a great love affair. It seemed to be much more uh, something that, uh, that was done in order to facilitate Joy staying in America, but they fell in love. And they had a very deep love, and it shortly after being married, Joy came down with cancer. And it was a real struggle, and again, I think probably many of you know the story behind it, uh, but she lost the battle. And, uh, and C.S. Lewis really, really struggled with this. Uh, I can remember, and I, I think this was a quote, but if you, any of you that saw the movie Shadowlands or have seen the play, which is about this period of time in his life, and... And, uh, you know, a, uh, a clergyman, uh, relatively, I don't know if I want to say naively, I don't want to be judgmental, but, you know, they, they come out of the funeral and the, and the guy comes up to C.S. Lewis and says something like, it's the Lord's will. It's not really a good thing to say to someone in the middle of this kind of a situation, because C.S. Lewis turns to him and he says, this is a bloody mess. And that's how he feels. And later, when he wrote about it, he actually wrote a book called The Problem, uh, Problem excuse me, A Grief Observed, and, uh, and he wrote it under uh, a pseudonym. He wrote it under another name because he was really wrestling through, and he made the statement that when Joy died, I became an atheist for three months. And eventually, you know, he came back around and came to a point of, of faith and trust but he certainly didn't understand it in the midst of it. And, uh, and, and again, you have to feel like, um, you know, Naomi felt like this. And perhaps you feel like this. Perhaps you have, you know, been in this. And when one of the things that I think is so powerful about this little book is that, you know, you, we might never know why some things happen in our lifetime. Uh, sometimes bad things happen, and perhaps as, you know, life goes on and, you know, life unfolds, we have an aha moment, and we can kind of look back and say, oh, now I get it. But the reality is, oftentimes, that doesn't happen, a and, and many of us will not know the why until we get into the presence of Christ someday. So we see in the book of Ruth how God uses this, but the reality is that you don't know how God uses it for over a thousand years. Now, ponder this, because ultimately at the end of the book, we're going to see something that God does through this entire situation, but it really doesn't manifest for a thousand years. And so the people, I mean, Naomi and Boaz and Ruth and the sons, you know, they didn't know it in their lifetime. And part of what I think this book does for us is to tell us you got to trust and you got to have faith. And sometimes, you know, faith is not seeing something. It's really 
trusting in the midst sometimes of circumstances we can't see. And we'll, by the time we get to the end of the book, some of you already know what that is, but we'll, we'll, we'll zero in. So Naomi's situation, she's kind of, you know, and, and then again, a little bit later on here in the text, you'll see this. She comes back to Bethlehem and she says this to those that come to greet her. Don't call me Naomi. Naomi means pleasant. So that was her name. It meant pleasant. She told them, call me Mara. And that is a word in Hebrew that means bitter. All right. So don't call me pleasant anymore. Call me bitter because the Almighty has made my life very hard. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. I, I think she's kind of lost her faith here a bit. And the result is life has become bitter. And again, what I think part of the message of the book is, and I'll, I'll insert it here as a takeaway, she can't see what God's up to or how he will use you know, what has happened in her life. And I think that, again, sometimes God's plans are simply unfathomable. <laughs> I mean, think about this. God, God is operating in a context of eternity. And, and, and there are things that happen in the plans of God where the seeds were planted, again, millennia ago. And our understanding is so limited. I, I, I don't know how many of you heard this week. I just, this just strikes me as part of this thing. How big God is. You know, we have talked on a number of occasions sort of looking at uh, the, the scope and the majesty of creation. And you've heard me say on a number of occasions that, you know, scientists believe, you know, there was a time when scientists, you know, this was a long time ago, but where scientists didn't even understand that there was a galaxy. I mean, science at a point in time thought, there's the sun, here's the earth, it's flat, by the way, you know, until science then said, no, wait a minute, it's not flat, you know, but, but their understanding of, of uh, you know, the universe was extremely small and limited, and then, you know, as time went on and, you know, and science became more sophisticated, they began to realize, wait a minute, we are part of something way bigger than the solar system, we're part of a galaxy, with millions and millions of stars in this galaxy. And, and, and for a period of time, that was the scientific understanding of the scope of the universe, one galaxy. And then as time went on, and again, you know, uh, scientific equipment became much more sophisticated, and suddenly they began to realize, wait a minute, it's not one galaxy. I mean, you know, space is populated by multiple, multiple galaxies. And, 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 and at a point in time, most recently, scientists would said, you know, there are 200 billion galaxies in the universe. I mean, how mind-boggling is that? Well, last week they discovered, they said, we're at least 10 times too small in our understanding. There are, there are at least 10 times that there are probably 2 trillion galaxies in the universe, and they're still operating with limitations. I mean, the scope of what God has created, again, and, and what, what that means in terms of who God is, it's just mind-boggling. And he is working out something that is so even beyond our ability to comprehend, and Amazingly, sometimes these little bitty hard things that happen are actually fitting in to something that for most of us, again, we, will, we won't even understand until we're in the presence of Christ. And I don't even know if we'll be able to comprehend it then. So, uh, so she loses faith and we lose faith. And we sometimes have to just give ourselves some time to process through and and be able to say, I don't understand it, but I do know that God has demonstrated his unbelievable love for us in such a way that, that I can trust. I, I've got to learn 
to trust. And we'll see how Naomi kind of comes around. She happens to be in a situation for at least she understands part or at least experiences part of God's outworking of that, but really doesn't have a clue ultimately how God uses this entire set of situations. So sometimes God's plans, they're just frankly uh, unfathomable, and, it, and we, we either trust or we don't trust. Now, that's the end of Act 1, Naomi's bitterness. Act 2 is, I would call, Ruth's faithfulness. And so we pick up Act 2 after all of the tragedy has happened to Naomi. And actually, we backtrack just a little bit here um, because we're going to find out about Ruth's faithfulness. Now, I, I joked around a little bit on our little video there. And, you know, it, you probably didn't even laugh at it. But, you know, I, I remember the first time I probably taught on this, I thought, now, there are some little known facts about Ruth. And, and you know, one of them is that when she was... A, an infant, they called her Baby Ruth. Uh, this, is, this, is the, this is the scope of my humor. It's really, it's pretty bad. And then, of course, she grew up and she was beautiful, and then they called her Babe Ruth. So, uh, anyway. Uh, but there are some well-known facts about Ruth. One is, we know she's a Moabite. Now, again, the, the Jews were not supposed to marry Moabites, but this is another thing. Think back this way. Do you know who the Moabites are? The Moabites are the descendants of what is a very bizarre and we would think twisted, probably, event in the history of Israel. At the time of Sodom and Gomorrah, okay, um, we have this situation where Lot's wife dies. She's turned, she looks back, not supposed to, you know, and she, she dies, and, uh, and Lot and his two daughters go and hide out in a cave. Now, the daughters are looking around and saying, you know, we're in trouble here because, you know, there, there aren't any prospects for a husband, and the only way we're ever going to have a lineage and a heritage is we got to get dad drunk and sleep with him. I mean, this is pretty, you know, this is not good stuff, right? And they do that, and they both get pregnant. And the older daughter has a son who becomes the beginning of the nation of Moab. Younger daughter, they become the Ammonites. And so when you look at the Moabites and the Ammonites, they go all the way back to this incident with Lot and his daughters. And amazingly, God uses that. I mean, it's, you know, I, we don't, I don't think we have the right box probably most of the time around the Lord. So, so here's the Moabites, and so you, they got a, a very strange, you know, kind of origin to begin with, and Ruth is a Moabite. She's a descendant of Lot and his daughter, and they were not to intermarry. Um, and what else we know about her, obviously, is that she marries a Jew, and he dies. So she's lost her husband. Her husband, his brother dies also, so there are no brothers. In the whole Jewish social system, if a, uh, if a man married and they didn't have children and the husband died and he had a brother, the brother was required to marry his brother's wife so that she would bear children. Well, Naomi knows this. I don't have any more sons. You know, so the situation looks a little bit hopeless. There is no kinsman redeemer, which is what the person was called, what the brother was called to come in and, you know, fulfill his duties. And so both of these daughters, they, ha they have a choice to make. Now, Naomi is getting ready to head back. And of course, Naomi encourages them to stay behind so that they can marry a Moabite man and have children. And one of the daughters uh, decides to stay. I think I might have the text here. Um, when Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food so the famine is over, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. And, uh, and one decides, no, I'm not going, and that is Orpah. Now, I was going to make a joke about this, I have to tell you. I was going, I was going to say, you know, uh, 
that this is the person that Oprah, I, Winfrey's mother named her after, but she was dyslexic. This is what I was, gonna, I was gonna say, which is probably not a good joke anyway, you know. But the reality is, this is the person that she was named after, and I have it on good authority from Jennifer McKee that on Oprah's birth certificate, it's actually Orpa, but everybody kept mispronouncing it as Oprah, and that Oprah was actually named after Orpa. Her mom must not have liked her, because I would have gone with Ruth. You know, I mean, it's going to name her after one of the, you know, but anyway. Um, so Orpa, or Oprah, anyway, Orpa stays behind, but Ruth comes with her. Ruth decides, makes a decision. And here is what Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. And this is kind of the classic text out of Ruth. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God, my God. I mean, this is a verse that's often read at weddings. It has nothing to do with a wedding. It's really, it's really a commitment between two women here. Okay, but and, and the big thing I think not only is the faithfulness of Ruth in love for her mom to to make this journey with her, but she's basically saying that she has now converted to belief and worship of the God of Israel, Yahweh. Your God will be my God. That, I think that's a huge piece of what happens here as the story unfolds itself. And so um, Naomi and Ruth, they head back to Bethlehem, again, hometown of Elimelech and Naomi, uh, part of the tribe of Judah and from the city of Bethlehem, which again is going to become quite important as we see how things get worked out here. And as they return home, that's the end of Act 2. So Naomi's bitterness, Ruth's faithfulness, and then I think the third act here, which we see in, uh, in the rest of the book, uh, I'm simply going to call, um, I'm going to call this, uh, let me see here, there we go, God's faithfulness, which is the big message of the book, by the way. So they, they, they come back to Jerusalem, and I'm going to have to pick up the pace here a little bit. And uh, the fir, kind of the first thing that we're told about is that, that Ruth um, decides to go gleaning. Now, gleaning is simply going after the harvest, so again, harvest time, in the Jewish economic system and back in the books of Deuteronomy and Leviticus, there was a great concern for the poor. And the way that there's a number of things that provided for the poor, but at the most basic level was that when you harvest, don't harvest everything. Leave behind some so that the poor can come and, and we can provide for the poor, and that's what gleaning was. It was going and, and gathering uh, that of the crop that had been left behind. And so Naomi is going to do this. And so Ruth the Moabite, I'm excuse me, Ruth's going to do this. Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favor. Well, she ends up in a field owned by a man by the name of Boaz. So she went out, entered a field, began to glean behind the harvesters, and as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Now, this looks like coincidence, by the way, and a friend of mine oftentimes has made the statement, and I like it, that, that coincidence is God's way of staying incognito, all right? God's, God's working in this whole deal, okay? So she ends up in the field uh, of Boaz. Again, it's harvest time. And, uh, and Boaz wants to know who, who this, he sees her. He wants to know, you know who this woman is. And, uh, and he's told, oh, here's, this is how I cast Boaz. He's, uh, Boaz, he's an older guy. He's a man of some standing. You know, he's, he's, a, he's a good guy. He's from the tribe of Judah. So we'll cast Sean Connery there. Okay. <laughs> Boaz asks his overseers, okay, uh, who does that young woman belong to? And the overseer tells her, well, she's, she's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. Now, you've got to figure, Bo, uh, Bethlehem is not a real big town. Everybody knows what's happened. Everybody knows about Naomi and that she has come home with Moabite women. And so he's told, well, that's, you know, that's who that is. 
And, uh, and so uh, when, he, when he hears about that, uh, he begins to uh, provide for her. And uh, he's heard what she did for Naomi. And uh, Ruth comes home. And, and when she comes home, she's got, we're told, 30 pounds of grain. And by the way, he, he treats her to lunch. And she brings the leftovers home too. All right. And so Ruth then gleans throughout the rest of the harvest on the property of Moab. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvest were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Well, Naomi's a pretty sharp gal, and she comes up with a plan. And the plan is found in the third chapter of, of Ruth, uh, and I, won't, I don't even know how much of this I have. I'm not sure I, I put a whole lot of the text in. Um, so here's Ruth's plan. Now, is not Boaz our kinsman uh, with whose maids you were? Behold, he winnows barley at the threshing floor tonight. Wash yourself, therefore, anoint yourself, put on your best clothes, and go down to the threshing floor. And I don't know if I have the next text. Okay, so she... You know, she becomes Babe Ruth, you know, gets all fixed up. And, uh, and Naomi says, when he goes to sleep, okay, you go in and slip under the blanket at his feet, which she does. And Boaz wakes up and asks, uh, who is there? And Ruth tells him who it is. And basically, when you read the text, kind of proposes to him. Now, by the way, let me see, I didn't see what, what I have next. All right, I'm going to go back there, go there in a second. Now, here's the equivalent of this. Naomi gets the keys to Boaz's apartment, okay? Ruth gets dolled up. Ruth slips in while he's sleeping and crawls into bed with him. I mean, that's what's happening here, okay? Boaz rolls over, and there's Ruth. Now, Boaz, he's an honorable man, so he doesn't take advantage of that. And he sends her home before the bellman arrives so that no one will know that she was there. It's a little risque. I'm not sure how we teach our kids in Sunday school this <laughs> particular story, but I, I don't think we really lay the whole deal out for him. Anyway, so Boaz responds and decides he wants to marry Ruth. Uh, there's a negotiation that takes place, and again, we don't have a lot of time for this. And, and what happens is that um, there's a, there is a... Uh, okay. I'm, I'm ahead of myself. There is another relative that is closer to Naomi and Elimelech than Boaz is. And again, under Jewish law, he has first right. And, and what's happening here is they aren't negotiating for Ruth. Ruth, they're negotiating for the land, all right? And so he gets first shot at the land. And it's really cool if you haven't read it. You've got to read Ruth if you haven't read it, because Boaz... He, he's, he's a business guy, all right? And he says, okay, you know, if, if you want the, you know, if you want the land, you can have it. And if you don't, I will. And the guy says, well, I want it. All right, I want the land. And Boaz says, that's great. Oh, oh, by the way, Ruth comes with it. And of course, if Ruth comes with it, that means his entire inheritance now is somewhat at risk because he's got to share it with Ruth and her descendants, if he takes the land, and then he decides, I don't want it. And he takes his sandal off and gives it to Boaz. And by the way, I don't know why they did it this way, but that was a sign of the transfer of property. It was just a symbol, you know, hey, I'm, here's my shoe, you've got it, it's yours, okay? And so Boaz redeems Elimelech's property, and Ruth comes with it. And Ruth and Boaz tie the knot. And let me see what I ever. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Ruth and Naomi have a son, and they name him Obed. And Obed gets married, he has a son, they name him Jesse. Jesse gets married, he has seven sons, one of whom is named David. And 14 generations later, out of the descent of Boaz and Ruth, 
A child is born in the city of David, where they're called back to because of the census, and his name is Jesus. Now, do you see why I'm saying it's a thousand years before any, and we've got, you know, we've got the good fortune that we see it in retrospect, but they didn't know any of this was going to happen. And yet out of that, obviously, uh, God does a wonderful thing. Ah, excuse me one second. All right. And uh, here's, here's kind of what I think the takeaway from that is. We don't always see it, but God is always faithful. He's always faithful. His plans are unfathomable, bull. <laughs> I'm going to learn to pronounce that word. Uh, and Jesus, his great, 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 great grandmother is a Moabite woman named Ruth. And I think the conclusion's pretty simple, that in the midst of an unfaithful time, in an unfaithful land, an unknowing Israelite woman named Naomi becomes a central figure in a cosmic drama and the experiences of tragedy in a fallen world bring bitterness to her life, but the one bright spot is a pagan daughter-in-law named Ruth who is faithful to her and to God, and God orchestrates and uses the events of their lives, first of all, to once again bring blessing to Naomi, but ultimately to bring blessing to the whole world, because God is always faithful. And that brings us up to our next stop, which is 1 Samuel. Dave's going to introduce us to it next week, and then the following week I'll, I'll go through the whole book with you. So let's pray together. Lord, uh, I, I do just think of, uh, of people, even in our room here, that I know have been through very difficult times. Um, tragedy, loss, uh, death of loved ones. Things that really, from a human perspective, oftentimes, they just don't make sense to us. And Lord, I am grateful that you understand that we are but flesh. You know our limitations. You understand when we feel like that. And, uh, and yet you love us. You love us. And, and we, we confess, gosh, two trillion galaxies. You know, you, your, your ways are so beyond our understanding. And, and Lord, we just need help sometimes. We need help uh, that, that even when things don't make sense, that we can trust you. And Lord, uh, you know, when we get mad at you, it, it doesn't really uh, affect you that much. You, you understand that. But we do pray, Lord, that, uh, that you would give us greater faith and Lord, more appreciation uh, for your faithfulness even when we can't see uh, the whys and the what's and the how's behind it. And we thank you for, for Ruth and Naomi and this great, great part of Israel's history. In Jesus' name, amen.